Welcome to Jewish Cinematheque, where we meet some of the important faces involved with films that tackle aspects of the Jewish experience. Today, I am joined by writer, director, and producer Jonathan Gruber, whose new film, Upheaval, The Journey of Menachem Begin, A Rebel Destined to Lead, is out for release. Jonathan's work includes the powerful documentaries, Jewish Soldiers in Blue and Gray, Pola's March, and Follow Me, the story of Yoni Netanyahu. With this new film, the first full-length English language feature to delve into Menachem Begin's life, we have a chance to learn about this unique Israeli leader who was imprisoned by the Soviets, orphaned by the Holocaust, elected prime minister on his ninth try, and crowned peacemaker by the Nobel Prize Committee. The prime minister was a fascinating leader, and Jonathan digs deep to try and provide an understanding of this modest and quite complex individual. His whole vision for Israel was for Jews to come here, feel like it's a safe haven. What he want to say is stay straight. Very different from my political views, but I think he was one of the greatest leaders that Israel had. Menachem Begin believed in the need for the Jews to seize their future. Begin was very much a survivor. Never again, there won't be another Holocaust in the history of the Jewish people. He was described as being anti-democratic, but he proved to be the most democratic of all. He had faith in his convictions and a very clear view of the way that things are supposed to go. He was a hero for all the Jewish Ethiopian community. No more war. He had the credibility to make the first peace with an Arab nation. He was a man of profound contradictions. Both sides were engaged in an existential fight. Israel has nothing to apologize for. Menachem Begin, with all his faults, belonged to a different class of leader. Rise, struggle, and guarantee the prospect of living in peace for your children and their children. Jonathan, welcome. Thanks so much, Eric. As a documentarian, uh, you have lots of work that you've done research on. How do you decide what you choose to include in a film, especially a film where you have so much material, I would imagine, about Menachem mm -hmm. Begin, and, and what you choose not to include? That's a great, great question. Um, the word that I always use, especially for a, a subject as, as rich, you know, with so many stories to tell as Menachem Begin is ruthless, that you really have to figure out what is sort of the core of the story uh, or, or the several cores of the story, and then push forward. For Menachem Begin, I felt that I, I definitely wanted to talk about his, the highs and the lows. Um, there were certain things that we left out of, of the Menachem Begin story. Just one example, you know, which, which felt like it was a little bit of inside baseball for American audiences is what he did in terms of the economy, uh, the Israeli economy, which is a huge story. I mean, basically bringing it from, you know, more of a social socialized economy to capitalism. But I just felt that in the period of time that we were talking about and sort of the arc of Menachem Begin's story that we were telling, which is about his life experiences and his connection to the Holocaust and how that uh, influenced every single decision that he made, at least that we uh, showed in the film, that that was one thing that we decided to leave out. Um, it's hard. It's hard to, to, you know, when you have 30 interviews, I mean, I was grateful that when I went uh, through the first cut that we really were, we weren't that far past 90 minutes. I think we were under two hours, which it was like a, whew, 
There's no, you know, now that the story's in, you know, we're in the ballpark. You, 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 I, uh, you, you brought in so many interesting interviews, um, you know, with, with really terrific people from, from Senator Joseph Lieberman to Ambassador Michael Oren. Uh, and, and, and you had to pull this together. So there you had these two hours to deal with. You said you dropped certain things you didn't include, the economy. Uh, how does a, a, a filmmaker decide what they feel is going to be important and what is not going to be important? And was there one specific audience you were looking at? Were you looking at the American audience? Were you looking at a broad audience? Well, it's it's primarily for an English speaking audience. And so, um, you know, that that narrows it down. I mean, the largest English speaking audience is North America. There's obviously the UK. Um, but frankly, you know, so these films about um, these Israeli subjects, as, as you mentioned, follow me. Um, it's hard to get them on in Europe, you know, because I think there's this sort of um, idea that this is a um, propaganda film or something. I think anyone that really sits down and would watch this film, I'm an awful Begum and see that we really don't, um, you know, cut him slack. I think, you know, when we talk about the war in Lebanon, we talk about even Daria Yassin, we talk about his approach to the settlements that we're, we're really, I, I have a journalism background. And so it's really important for me to tell the stories in as much in the most complex, nuanced and fair way possible. What's unfortunate is that even with all of those interviews that we got is we only had one Arab interview. It was desperate is not the right word, but it's what it feels like. But I was desperate to have Arab voices in the film. We interviewed an Egyptian academic um, and it was great to have him in there. And he added some some really important things. But then after the interview, he even after he signed the agreement, uh, he said that he didn't want to be in the film. So we said, OK, that's fine. There was a Palestinian academic who canceled the day before. I think the the state of things is that people are very concerned about being co-opted into something that might be only telling one side of the story. And so um, I think for people who the film is for people who don't really understand the state of Israel and the history of Israel. It's a way of looking at it through one of the really the founding fathers, you know, uh, people who know David Ben-Gurion don't really understand how how Menachem Begin was sort of the yin to his yang in many ways. Let's stay with that for a minute, because uh, Ben-Gurion and Begin had a very uh, an interesting relationship. How's that for a term? Um, they sure, I'll take it. They were, in a sense, arch enemies, and, and yet late in life, uh, they, they came together and, and, and became friends. What was that all about? Was it just the fact that one wanted to be the leader, or was it very different ways of looking at life and at the Jewish people and, and what Israel should be? So I haven't, you know, done extensive research on Ben Gurion. I've, you know, watched a few films and, and know about him, of course. Um, Politically, they were just opposed. And I think they maybe just looked at the world in a different way in terms of from a Jewish point of view that I think Menachem Begin was very comfortable in the past and in the traditions of Judaism. And David Ben-Gurion, who um, was more future focused and said, listen, let's shed this sort of, you know, shtetl living, you know, that we came from and where these strong, powerful Jews were the new Jews. And so I think a lot of a lot of that might have come from those philosophical differences. And um, it's funny, I'm actually, I think I'm fourth cousins once removed from David Ben-Gurion. So, uh, or, or first cousins four times removed, however you say it. And uh, exactly. So, you know, but I didn't let Ben-Gurion off the hook either in this film. <laughs> That's for sure. Uh, yeah, you, you provide some fascinating footage of, of Begin in his early years. How, looking at it, how much of an influence did that experience of being in Europe into the really late 1930s, how much did that impact uh, Begin and, and just the way he carried himself, even as prime minister? I think it was everything. When, you're, when your family has been destroyed um, by the war, uh, you know, every, every survivor's sort of memory and behaviors in, in my mind are sacred. I, I am a grandchild of Holocaust survivors. And even though Menachem Begin wasn't in the camps, he was a survivor. He ran and escaped from the Nazis and then was in the Gulag. 
So, I mean, that his life was was forever changed because of the Nazis. So he's a survivor as much as someone who was in Auschwitz. It's a different experience, but his experience was awful. And so as I was coming to understand Begin's story, because I didn't really know that much, you know, aside from the peace accords, um, it was clear to me that I wanted to infuse either specific references to the Holocaust that he would make or just sort of the theme of the Holocaust throughout the film so that people can understand that every time he made a decision, whether it was bombing the, um, the Iraqi nuclear reactor at Osirak or going into Lebanon to, to um, you know, stop the rockets that were coming in, it was all because he said, I, we will not have another Holocaust and I will do everything in my power to protect the Jewish people and to protect the state of Israel because he had seen it. He had seen anti-Semitism growing up uh, in Poland. He had seen it obviously in World War II. He saw it in the Gulag. He saw it fighting the Arabs. He saw it with the British. So that was um, something that was just a part of who he was. As uh, Yossi Klein Halevi says in the film, there is no, there is no Menachem Begin without the Holocaust. He arrives in Israel or in Palestine, as it was. And uh, at the age of 30, he becomes leader of, of, of what? Of the Irgun. Um, yeah. And, and he had to make certain choices. I mean, here the war's begun. Britain uh, is fighting Nazi Germany. And yet Britain is also excluding Jews, keeping Jews from coming to Palestine because of their 1939 white paper. Mm -hmm. Begin decided to take a more extremist view towards the British. Um, can you talk a little bit about what do you think was what was in his mind? I mean, you know, here you have an army, a massive army that's fighting the Nazi army, which is killing Jews. And yet they're also your potentially your enemy there. Can you can you just how was that to even put that into a film? Well, it's complicated, like most things. Um, I think we, you know, we we touched on on Big, and actually, there's an old interview from a from an Irgun documentary that we got where he said that we decided that um, the Nazis, that the the British were essentially killing Jews on some level by not allowing them in. So, in his mind, they were it's it's uh, strange to say, but they were equivalent on some level to the Nazis because they were not allowing Jews to escape uh, from Europe. And in terms of what he, what he decided to do, there were, there were three main groups, as you know, people who were watching this might, might know. There was the Haganah, who said, let's negotiate with the British you know, for our own homeland. There was the Irgun, who said, we're, there were, the Irgun and the Lehi, who said, we're going to fight. But there were two different ways of doing it. The Lehi were a little bit more violent, whereas the Irgun, Begin said, we're only going to target uh, things that, where we don't kill people. We're going to target installations. Now, that obviously didn't happen the way he planned it, especially with the King David Hotel. But there was some, you know, some method to, to what he was doing. And, uh, you know, this was and obviously he's fighting, fighting and, and there are people who are dying and they're, whether it's Brits or Arabs or Jews, and uh, and it was complicated. And he got a I don't want to say he got a bad rap. He was fighting. And these are things that I, I can't answer to say what he was or what he wasn't. That's people should watch the film and make determinations on their own. When you blow up a hotel and kill 96 people, you still did it, even when you warned people for half an hour to get out of the building. You know, one of the things that comes through is, I guess, his menschlichkeit, uh, what kind of a special guy he was. In, in 44, 45, I mean, fellow Jews were going after his Irgun members and turning them over to the British. And yet he mm. kept on saying to his people, you can't shoot at another Jew. So he's being yeah. shot at, and yet he's telling them you can't shoot back. What does this say? Well, that's the all that. Yeah, that's the all that's I mean, specifically, that's the Altalena incident. Um, but it's a, that's but what you're talking about is something a little bit different, which was called the hunting season. My French is terrible, so I can't pronounce it properly. Um, but he um, they were turning in the Irgun members. And, and I think especially being in the shadow of the Holocaust, that to say that we're we're now we've we've survived this you know awful situation, this tragic situation. And now we're going to fight each other. That's just not going to happen. And in, in some ways. 
Menachem Begin's lack of a response to fighting against the Haganah was instrumental in fighting the Jewish state. If the Haganah had to fight the Irgun in addition to the Brits and the Arabs, who knows how history would have been different. Although there's some who say that they did have to fight them, but that's a whole different story. Um, and these are all these are all great conversations for like, again, you know, I, I did not make this film as an apologist, you know, for Menachem Begin. I think these are all really, really important stories. And they it's again, people can watch the film and hopefully get a sense of why Israel is the you know complicated and wonderful and sometimes terrible country that it is. So you show a whole variety of moments in Begin's life in, in a very creative way the King David Hotel, the Altalena affair, which was the affair where uh, Begin ship was bringing uh, ammunition for the Jewish state. Controversial. Mm -hmm. One of the things uh, I noticed that you left out, I don't know if it was on purpose, on the shore fighting at Begin, firing on Begin and his men was not only Yigal Alom, but Yitzhak Rabin. Mm -hmm. uh, was there a I didn't leave it, it didn't leave it out intentionally. It just felt like it was, you know, going to take you into a place that was the fact was he was getting shot at. And the fact was that he told his men not to fire back. And that prevented potentially a civil war. Um, Yitzhak Rabin is. And what's you know, what I love about film is that really it's not supposed to be the white paper on, on a subject. It's supposed to be an introduction. It's the tip. And so people, when I made my film about Entebbe and the Yoni Netanyahu, people said, didn't you know Idi Amin, you know, trained in Israel? I was like, yes, I do know that. And if you're interested in it, then you should go read a book about it and find out more. So you're absolutely right. Yitzhak Rabin was there. And so these are sort of the, you know, the, the Mount Rushmore, you know, of Israel. And uh, yeah, that, I didn't I didn't keep it out intentionally. It just felt like it would have taken a little too long. So this is my question for you as a filmmaker. I mean, so you have to make certain choices and, and to, not to divert your subject into a into a direction that you didn't want it to go. Uh, Correct. But sometimes there are there are places that you do want to go, like what was super uh, important for me was to talk about his democratic liberal values, even though people you know, said he was a right winger, he was a fascist based on him being in the Irgun, based on him, even the way he protested against Holocaust reparations to the point that he started a riot against the Knesset and that people were throwing rocks and he was banned for three months, you know, from being in 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 holding, you know, being in the Knesset and, and being, uh, you know, the political leader that he was for the opposition. Um, it was really important to say that here he was a person who said that people like Arab Israeli citizens, for instance, they should not be under military rule, which was the case, which was shocking to me as I was, you know, reading this, that from 1948 till the mid 60s, the Arab villages were under Israeli military rule. And he said, no, these are citizens. These are Arab Israeli citizens and they should have the same rights as Jews. He brought in as prime minister, he brought in Ethiopian Jews. He brought in, he agitated against, you know, the Soviet Union to bring in Russian Jews. He even brought in Vietnamese boat people. And, you know, these are uh, remarkable, remarkable qualities. He was a refugee himself, so he knew what it was like. And, and these are um, just, you know, they're, they're and then people, people here in the end. And then the other thing that he did was the Sephardim. The, Mis the Mizrahis is another thing that I learned about um, that I I'm so grateful to be able to tell these stories because I learned the complexities of Israel, the understanding that there was so much discrimination uh, against these North African and Middle Eastern Jews in Israel by the sort of Ashkenazi European elite. And Menachem Megan said, no, this is unacceptable. And they were a part of his political base. But he not only one finally after you said nine times in, in 1977 and, you know, got those votes, but he delivered for them. He these these were people, many of them who had, you know, who were well established and respected people in their countries. And they came to these development towns in the middle of the desert or in Israel were living in tents. I mean, this is talk about the lack of dignity. And he felt that these Jews needed, should have the dignity that they deserve. And so he put money into something called Project Renewal and built homes and built and helped them get careers. Even our, at the end of the film, there's a beautiful song called Sion Tamati, which is an ancient, ancient song by Menachem Mendel Delitsky. And uh, Rem Bashari is this uh, really talented musician who recorded it. He learned music 
in one of those development towns and the musical program was put in place because of the money that Menachem Begin helped, um, you know, create because of project renewal. Jonathan, the, the, so the, long answer. <laughs> the footage, the footage that you were able to pull together, I mean, sitting and watching, you know, you, you have these images of, of Menachem Begin and there he is sitting, you know, uh, and chatting with, with Israeli Arabs or Israel, what today we might call Israeli Palestinians. And, and, and the, the sort of mutual respect and love they seem to be showing each other, wonderful, powerful. If there were to be one major accomplishment uh, uh, and one major disappointment that you found in Begin, what do you think that might be? Uh, you know, it's funny because we talk about so many things about Menachem Megan's life that are fascinating, but you, um, sometimes we're remiss in overlooking peace with Egypt, which is, you know, clearly, and uh, the man won the Nobel Peace Prize with Anwar Sadat, um, had never been done before. Israel was fighting, was fighting wars, had, had fought five wars in 30 years with, with Egypt and other, you know, its neighbors. And to do something that was unthinkable at the time. And, and I mean, credit needs to go to Anwar Sadat as well to, you know, to take that chance. And ultimately he paid with his life for it. But Menachem Begin, his ability to not only negotiate with Anwar Sadat, but to negotiate with people in his own party, because it's Israel's a democracy, just because he agreed, unlike Anwar Sadat, who, who, whatever he said was, was the law and was what was going to happen. Menachem Begin had to convince members of the Knesset to vote for this agreement that he and, you know, his uh, his negotiating team had hammered out at Camp David. So that I mean, it's remarkable. And when you see today, I mean, then there's peace with with Jordan and the Abraham Accords today. I mean, it really um, I think it's all based on the fact that Menachem Begin was the first to do it. Um, And I think, you know, by the same token, in terms of the sort of the, the, the biggest mistake or tragedy uh, is the war in Lebanon and uh, and the deaths, not only the soldiers deaths, but the devastation, you know, wrought on Lebanon and how and how it uh, destabilized the country, Um, the suffering that that the people of that country. It's a war. The country was turned into a war zone. The Palestinians were shooting rockets and Israel said that's enough. Now, in theory, when those first objectives were met, maybe they should have stopped. And that's, you know, another a whole nother situation about Ariel Sharon's responsibility for this. Um, but Menachem Begin ultimately, and this is part of, you know, one of the, the things that I found to be so um, admirable about him is that as a leader, he, stu- he, he, he made a decision. He took the credit, although he was a pretty humble guy, so he didn't really do it like that necessarily. But he took the blame, more importantly. Um, and he took the blame to the point that he resigned from his prime ministership. I mean, it was in combination with the fact that his wife, who he loved tremendously, and I'd love to talk about that a little bit as well, because I think that's a, a very uh, key part of his uh, part of his life. But what leader today would resign for making a mistake on that level? It seems that people cling to power uh, so much so. And um The fact that he left and said, I'm not doing the job anymore, says so much, you know, about his honor and his own dignity, about what he felt was right for for himself and for the people of Israel. What about his relationship with his wife? I mean, you do bring that in and and it's clear that that really caught you as a filmmaker. It was beautiful. It was beautiful to to be running for, first of all, to be in the opposition for 29 years as the leader is, I don't know, you know, who's going to let someone not, (laughs) you know, lose and lose and lose and still be the leaders that speaks to, to him. Um, But there he is on election night, he's won. And the first thing he says is he quotes from Jeremiah and he says, you know, I want to say this to my wife who's been with me through all these times just such a such a humble man to immediately thank his wife, not at the end, the first thing. And he did this often. You know, at the, there's a, another a state dinner, a White House state dinner at the end of the film, where, again, he thanks his wife. He says, thank you for persevering with me. And it was a beautiful relationship. They went through so much together. They were teenagers or she, she was a teenager when they were married. I think he was 20. They were separated by World War II. He went to the Gulag and seemingly never to be seen again. Um, miraculously, he got out 
and got an all expense paid trip to Palestine with Andrew's army and then was uh, reunited with his wife. And then they were together in the opposition in the underground while the Brits were looking for him. They, he, their relationship was so close. Many of these underground leaders were on their own and going from house to house to house. He was doing that too, but he was doing that with his family. He was doing that with his wife and with his kids and that he didn't want to be separated from them, even though he was on the run. And so the, obviously the dedication that they had for, for each other was just remarkable. And so, as I just said before, the combination of his wife dying and the Lebanon war going so terribly really just um, devastated him. You chose to be a filmmaker. You were you have journalistic background. Why? Why, you know, I mean, we do this is a program where we look at film and we talk with filmmakers. Why did you decide to go in this direction? It's a good question. I guess. uh, I guess my uh, you know, it always comes from what you see when you're young. And and my father, who actually is an actuary, decided to be uh, go to Columbia Journalism uh, grad school. And I just remember he went to he was writing and I just thought, oh, that seems cool. But I wanted to be a reporter. And then you're you're in the New York area. So you probably know Chuck Scarborough. So there's a great uh, a great story about him when I was in eighth grade. They said, let's do a paper on what you want to do. And I wanted to be a TV reporter. And so I wrote to the New York stations and each one of them said it was at the time and no one's going to know these names except people who are from New York and for a long time. But Bill Butel and Roger Grimsby was ABC. Rollin Smith was CBS and Chuck Scarborough was NBC. And Chuck said, sure, come on down. You know, this is my report on what I want to be. And so I interviewed him. And, you know, from there, it was uh, not a far jump. I, I wound up going to college for broadcast journalism, for television news, but realized that I didn't really want to be on camera and I didn't want to tell two minute stories um, that, but I still wanted to be a storyteller. And, uh, and we live in a visual medium, we're visual people and writing is just much harder than, than making films to me. You always have, you can just say like, if you want to write something about Washington DC, you have to know it. You have to, you know, talk about the, the weather or the, the sites, but for a film, you can just be like, here's an exterior, you know, of the Capitol that's Washington DC. So it's a shorthand that, that, and, uh, and I love it. And I'm grateful that I'm able to make films, you know, and, and have a career and that people, you know, come to me for projects. And uh, I guess that, that hopefully that answers what you're looking for. The film is a people, the story of Menachem Begin, filmmaker, writer, director, producer, Jonathan Gruber. It's a film that tackles a very difficult subject a very, about a very unique man in a beautiful way. So please make an effort to go see it as soon as you can. Jonathan, thank you so much for joining us. It's really been a delight. Thank you, Eric, so much for your uh, for your questions. It's made me think about things I haven't thought about in a while. Great.